Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to let uh, people stream in for a minute. We're waiting on uh, a good sized audience. So um, it's 6 p.m. here in Mountain Time, but I'm just going to wait just a minute while the audience kind of gets settled, so to speak. Um, thanks so much for being with us. Okay, so I have a fairly long introduction um, to this event. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started uh, so that we can get what is bound to be a really wonderful celebration going, okay? Um, welcome everyone to this Montana Book Festival event. This is Untrammeled Renegade Genius, Jim Harrison as poet. We are all excitedly gathered in our respective Zoom spaces this evening to celebrate uh, Jim Harrison, specifically Jim Harrison, the poet. My name is Lauren Korn. I'm the director of the Montana Book Festival. I am Zooming in, as I usually am, from my office in the Mountain Press Publishing Company building here in Missoula, Montana. This event is proudly sponsored by a number of local organizations and businesses, including Arts Missoula, MissoulaEvents.net, Humanities Montana, and the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation. The Whitefish Review is our collector's edition sponsor for this event, and we are so happy to have their team, including editor Brian Schott, as sponsors um, of both this event and of our growing festival. We're also extremely lucky to have Copper Canyon Press on board with us for this event, uh, specifically Joseph Bednarik, who worked di diligently behind the scenes uh, with me to help coordinate. And apart from Jim, the poet himself, Copper Canyon Press is the mastermind or masterminds behind Jim Harrison Complete Poems. I've got my advanced copy here. It is a tome. Uh, this, uh, this is a beautiful and as again, the title lays bare a very complete book of Jim's poetry. And it's Jim's poetry and we can't stress this enough um, that we are here to celebrate this evening. Copper Canyon, has become the steward of Jim's legacy, um, and this complete book of poems is now one very large part of that legacy. A big thank you to Fact and Fiction Books uh, here in Missoula, Montana, for being our festival bookseller. Um, for those of you who purchased a copy with your ticket tonight, Fact and Fiction will be the ones to ship your copies of Jim Harrison Complete Poems once the event is over. Um, and for those of you who purchased or, or you know, registered with a free ticket to tonight's event, it's not too late to buy this collection. Um, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of Jim Harrison, Complete Poems, you can do so through our festival bookseller, again, Fact and Fiction, at factandfictionbooks.com. Please be sure to enter MBF at checkout so that 20% of those sales do come back to the festival so we can continue programming events like this one. Um, again, an enormous thank you to all of our sponsors and to our festival partners. Um, and I also want to quickly shout out Steve Spencer. Uh, he is the man behind Jim's active Facebook page, um, Steve has done a lot to promote this event, but beyond that, he's done uh, so much to keep Jim's legacy alive for literature lovers all over the world. So thank you, Steve. I do have a few logistics for you, a little bit of housekeeping before uh, things officially get started tonight. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to invite you as attendees to submit your questions via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You'll notice that there's both a chat and a Q&A. Um, if you have specific questions for our authors tonight, please put them in the Q&A so that we can see them. The chat kind of gets uh, kind of messy with a lot of comments and we wanna make sure that we're seeing your questions. But that said, I do wanna make sure um, that you are engaging in the chat. Feel free to have a conversation with each other. Um, my uh, Montana Book Festival volunteer, Sarah Captival and I, we will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A. So um, we'll probably address your questions towards the, the latter part of the conversation. Um, I want to say before I pass things on to the MC tonight, um, you're going to notice a slight change to, to tonight's lineup. Um, unfortunately, Terry Tempest Williams uh, is unable to be with us here tonight. Um, she is heartbroken and we are heartbroken that she's not with us. 
uh, she has assured us that she is here in spirit and I know I feel her here. Um, and to make sure that is the case, I am actually going to read an excerpt from Terry's introduction to, again, this single volume. Um, so I'm gonna do that now before I pass things along to Chris Dombrowski. So um, Terry's uh, introduction to that single volume is called Everything on Earth is True. Um, and she has a, a small epigraph, which is uh, a few lines from Jim from Homily. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to jump around a little bit um, and then again, pass things on to Chris. So this is the epigraph. These simple rules to live within, a, bla a black pen at night, a gold pen in daylight. He crumples as paper, but rises daily from the dead. This is Terry. The book you now hold in your hands is the physical evidence of a life well lived by a, na a man named Jim Harrison, who was in love with the world. He was a man of big appetites, not only for good food and fine wines, but also for tasting, smelling, hearing, feeling, and seeing what nature, both human and wild, had to show him about living and dying and locating a sliver of light in so much darkness. Writing poems was Harrison's spiritual practice, following that line of light, walking the path of poetry in crepuscular hours when wolves howl and ravens fly. Jim Harrison Complete Poems is a pilgrimage through a dedicated life of a writer who dared to give up again this human shape and see beyond our own solipsism and human exceptionalism. On your walks in the back country, he writes, get to where you're going, then walk like a heron or sandhill crane. They don't miss a thing. He exhorts us, listen to the alarm. In After Ikkyu, he writes, everywhere I go, I study the scars on Earth's face, including rivers and lakes. I'm not playing God, but assessing intent. In the Patagonia mountains, you think small minds, pathetic deaths. In Cabeza Prieta, men boiled in their own blood, ground temperature 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Contrails of earthen scar tissue, stink of sulfur, gold and copper to buy the horse that died, the woman who left. And I'm gonna jump a little bit further on in Terry's introduction when she writes, we are nothing without metamorphosis. We are changelings on a changing earth. Jim Harrison marked the transformations in the landscapes he called home, from the upper peninsula of Michigan to the Sonoran Desert of Arizona, to the Northern Rockies on the edge of Yellowstone in Livingston, Montana. His poems are checkpoints on the map of his soul. It doesn't really matter if these poems are thought of as slightly soiled Dharma gates or just plain poems, he writes. They'll live or die by their own specific density, flowers for the void. To write a poem, you must first create a pen that will write what you want to say. For better or worse, this is the work of a lifetime. And it is this work of a lifetime to which we are here to pay tribute, to celebrate. So thank you, Terry, for your words. Uh, we feel your presence in this space. And I know a couple of the other authors are going to speak towards your intro tonight as well. And with that, I am ready to turn things over to Jim's friends, family, and fans. I think we should get on with this show, right, to this celebration of Jim and his poetry. I'd like to, I'd like to introduce you all to tonight's moderator or MC the poet, Chris Dombrowski. Hi, Chris. Hey, Lauren, how are you? I'm doing so well. I'm gonna read your bio and then turn things over to you, okay? Superb. Chris Dombrowski once prepared a gourmet river lunch of morel mushrooms and pheasant breasts for Jim Harrison, only to forget the propane tank for his grill. At least Jim, surprisingly forgiving for a man of large appetites, had brought the wine. Born in Michigan, Dombrowski is the author of three books of poetry, most recently Ragged Anthem, and the acclaimed memoir Body of Water, a Bloomberg News 2016 Book of the Year. He lives with his lovably feral family in Missoula and teaches in the MFA program at the University of Montana. Take it away, Chris. 
Thanks, Lauren. Thanks so much for for all you do and, and all you've done this year with the Fest. It's been amazing. Uh, it's a thrill to be here tonight uh, with three writers whose work I love to celebrate Jim's poetry. We don't have a great deal of time, so I'll move straight into introductions and um, give the audience a little bit of uh, the run of the show. Our first presenter tonight, Chris Latre, is a Matisse writer and storyteller. His first book, One Sentence Journal, Short Poems and Essays from the World at Large, won the 2018 Montana Book Award and a 2019 High Plains Book Award, a book of haiku and haibun called Descended from a Travel-Worn Satchel was recently published by Foothills Publishing. And his book of nonfiction, Becoming Little Shell, will be published by Milkweed Editions in 2022-ish. He is an enrolled member of the Little Shell tribe of Chippewa Indians and lives near Missoula. Our third presenter, Jamie Harrison, who has a crippling stage fright and wonders where the hell the band all is when she needs it, has lived in Livingston, Montana for more than 30 years. She is the author of six novels, most recently, The Fabulous Center of Everything, and also works as an editor. Uh, and rounding us out tonight, uh, born and raised in Dublin, Ireland, Colin McCann is the author of seven novels and three collections of stories. He is the recipient of numerous international awards for his fiction, the Dublin Literary Prize, a Chevalier des Arts and Letters from the French government and the U.S. National Book Award for Let the Great World Spin. Or in his own words, Colin McCann is Irish, but that's not his fault. So uh, without further delay, I will turn it over to Chris Latre. I'm just going to like launch right in here with this poem, I believe, and then I'll, then I'll talk. Um, I believe. I believe in steep drop-offs, the thunderstorm across the lake in 1949, cold winds, empty swimming pools, the overgrown path to the creek, raw garlic, used tires, taverns, saloons, bars, gallons of red wine, abandoned farmhouses, stunted lilac groves, gravel roads that end, brush piles, thickets, girls who haven't quite gone totally wild, river eddies, leaky wooden boats, the smell of used engine oil, turbulent rivers, lakes without cottages lost in the woods, the primrose growing out of a cow skull, the thousands of birds I've talked to all of my life, the dogs that talk back, the chihuahuan ravens that follow me on long walks, the rattler escaping the cold hose, the fluttering unknown gods that I nearly see from the left corner of my blind eye, struggling to stay alive in a world that grinds them underfoot. So I have the unenviable task of being the only person on this panel who never met Jim Harrison, though I did sit outside his driveway in Patagonia with a companion like nudging me, go knock on the door, go knock on the door. And now I'm glad I didn't because that was only, I don't know, two and a half months before he passed away. And we all, even those of us who don't know, know stories of how Jim could be and often was, but doesn't, wasn't necessarily always that way. So I have the stories in my head of how that might have turned out. But the important thing for me was that particular poem from In Search of Small Gods. And that was the poem that, you know, I read. And it was the first poem that I ever read that just, you know, we all have those poleaxe moments of literature. And for me, that was it. You know, I'd always already been reading his fiction, but that poem spoke to me as a guy who's kind of a rube, you know, I never studied any of this stuff. I have a high school education. I'm more connected to the Jim Harrison who talks about burning the roof of his mouth with hot dogs and the quality of Albertson's fried chicken eating cold on a fishing trip, you know, that connects to me more than, than 30 whatever course dinners in Paris that, that you know, it's, 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 it's the thing about Jim that connected so many of us, so many walks of life and a way that, that that just 
enormous personality and the the gift of words that could bridge cultures that we all would love to be able to do with our work and and he did as well or better than anyone so that poem really kind of launched me into doing you know kind of finding a voice of my own that that was certainly mentored and continues to be mentored by the work of Jim Harrison and the next step there was was Braided Creek, the book he did with Ted Kuzer, Conversation and Poetry, where, you know, the story is, is Ted is recovering from cancer treatment and they're sending poems to each other, short poems on postcards back and through, back and forth through the mail, which is its own kind of romance, because how many of us actually send snail mail postcards anymore, which it's wonderful practice. And, you know, the idea of these two massively talented poets how many postal workers got to read those things were before any of us did you know there had to be some and, and what was telling about that is is they were you know writing these short little three to seven line poems and at the time I was doing a practice of um just writing sentences every day as I was working a job that that often left me no time to write and I thought, if I can write one sentence every day, no matter where I am, in whatever shithole, food, desert, town, in where the hell am I, Wisconsin, I could do something related to the work I wanted to be doing. And when I read these poems, I thought, you know, I can redo my sentences into short little poems and try and, again, follow this path being blazed by these other guys. So I can literally say, without these two books... I would not be here. I would not, or or I would not have gotten here in the time frame that I have without these two books, because they were were light posts in the darkness, if we want to call, call it that, for someone like me who was just trying to figure out a way to express in words emotions that I didn't really know how to do it. I never had Jim was my teacher, and when my first book came out. Um, you know, goes through and and we ran out. And the same day that a shipment, a new shipment of more books that I had to sign to send out to people also happened to be the day that the paperback edition of Dead Man's Float came out. Um, and I had already, you know, I've got like four different versions of this book. So it, it's one of those for me that that is a, a, another kind of benchmark because you know writing reviews of it connected to me all these other poets and you know as, as those of us who have the book know you know the last page is, is Jim's death poem you know what he was writing when he passed away and I hadn't really processed my own book and and here's this pile of mine next to this pile of Jim's book and I was suddenly just struck by the emotion of what this man's work had done for me, you know, without ever having met him. And that was the moment where it all came and I walked back to the back of the bookstore and and just waterworks ugly cried for for 10 minutes, you know, just just having, you know, these two things in my hands for me was was, you know, I, I can't describe what that feeling was like. And, and again, this simply because of the work of, of a man that I never had a chance to meet. Another story related to the ways that Jim's work connected people is when my book came out and I talk about Jim Harrison all the time, out of the blue, this guy asks me for, uh, for my mailing address and I give it to him and he sends me this cassette audio version of Jim reading after IQ. And that's one of those you know, kind of things you get out in the book world and, and the generosity of your readers that, that will send you stuff and, and that you connect to. So I bought one of those little uh, machines that you can take a cassette and just rip it to MP3s. And I, you know, I've been sharing the hell out of that recording because it's Jim reading it. Um, so after Icky was already one of my special books as well, um, as I too have an affinity for the for the Japanese and Chinese poets. And I thought I would read his preface to uh, this book, preface to After Ikki You and other poems, which I love. And to hear him read it on the cassette is, is one of my favorite things too. 
I began my Zen studies and practice well over 20 years ago in a state of rapacious and self-congratulatory spiritual greed. I immediately set about reading hundreds of books on the subject, almost all contemporary and informed by an earnest mediocrity. There was no more self-referential organism alive than myself, a potato that didn't know it was a potato. Naturally, the years have passed quickly, if not brutishly. I practiced because I value life, and this seems the best way for me to get at the heart of the matter. We are more than dying flies in a shithouse, though we are that too. There are hundreds of ways to tip off a cushion and only one way to sit there. Zen is the vehicle of reality, and I see almost as much of it in Wordsworth as I do in Chan texts. As I've said before, it's easy to mistake the plumbing for the river. We in the West are prone to ignore our own literary traditions, while in the East, Zenists were industriously syncretic, gathering poetry, Confucius, and Taoism to their breasts. There is scarcely a better way to turn the page than I'm doing it right now. There is scarcely a better koan than Ahab before the whiteness of a whale who sees a different ocean from each side of its massive head. The sequence after Ikkyu was occasioned when Jack Turner passed along to me the record of Tung Shan and the new Master Yunman, edited by Earth's app. It was a dark period, and I spent a great deal of time with the books. They rattled me loose from the oppressive Polack state of distraction we count as worldly success. But then we are not fueled by pithes and gists, but by practice, which is Yunman's unshakable point amongst a thousand other harrowing ones. I was born a baby. What are these hundred suits of clothes I'm wearing? Of course, the reader should be mindful that I'm a poet, and we tend to err on the side that life is more than appears rather than less. I do not remotely consider myself a Zen Buddhist, as that is too ineptly convenient and a specific barrier for one whose lifelong obsession has been his art rather than his religion. Someone like Robert Aiken Roshi is a Zen Buddhist. I'm still a fool. Early on in my teens, I suffocated myself with Protestant theology and a mindful in Coleridge's terms that, like spiders, we spin webs of deceit out of our big hanging asses, whether with Jesus or the Buddha. But still practice is a creative. And those who open doors for me, like Zen creatures, Peter Matheson, Gary Snyder, Koven Shino Sensei, Bob Watkins, Dan Gerber, and Jack Turner, to name a few prominent ones. It doesn't really matter if these poems are thought of as slightly soiled Dharma gates or just plain poems. They'll live or die by their own specific density, flowers for the void. The poems were written within the discrete interval described so poignantly by Tang Shan. Earnestly avoid seeking without, lest it recede far from you. Today I am walking alone, yet everywhere I meet him. He is now no other than myself, but I am not now him. It must be understood in this way in order to merge with suchness. To write a poem, you must first create a pen that will write what you want to say. For better or worse, this is the work of a lifetime. And I'm going to end my part of this program with this that I just opened to earlier today, and I took it as a message from Jim that I should read this. It's the seventh poem in the series, the After Icky series. With each shot, he killed the self until there was no one left to bring home the bacon. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Chris Latre. Can everyone hear me okay? It's a strange vacuum out here. Uh, as we all agreed, um, it's it's just so wonderful to be here, and I I don't really trust myself to stay within the allotted time limit unless I read from my notes. So I, I do apologize if my um, if my eyes are facing elsewhere. As Jim wrote in Larson's Holstein Bull, death steals everything except our stories. So I figured I would begin with one. It was June twenty ten. I believe, and Jim was at our house in the Rattlesnake for dinner. We had just returned from a treacherous float down Rock Creek. By treacherous, I mean the river they call a creek was in full vent runoff when we launched. I mean, double the average flows. I mean, the current shot us downriver 
as if from a sling. The oarlocks were smoking. We overtook birds in flight. Launching the boat had been a horrible call. It was my call. Uh, and I spent the day cranking on the oars, worried that my literary hero, not terribly nimble at that point in his life, would end up drowned. Later that night, Jim sat down at our dining room table next to our not quite six-year-old son. Luca, your father tells me that you like to ski. I do a pretty good gym impression, but I'm gonna spare you all from it tonight. Uh, that nasally growl, I love to imitate it, but it probably won't translate over Zoom. At any rate, uh, Luca, your father tells me that you like to ski. House, uh, he rested his ironwood cane on the chair next to us and lit an American spirit. House rules, no smoking, but we were making an exception. We had just learned through the grapevine that a guided raft floating roughly an hour behind ours on the creek had flipped on a standing wave and lost one of its passengers to a log jam. Just upstream from the microburst, the experienced oarsman at the helm of that raft had taken the right channel. An hour prior, Jim and I had taken the left. Rescue crews had failed to recover the body. When you're skiing down the mountain, Luca, I'm sorry, when you're skiing down the mountain, Jim continued pouring his erratic gaze into Luca's. Did you ever see a snow snake? I pushed a cheese plate across the table. What's a snow snake? Luca responded with an earnest rise. A snow snake, Jim replied, smacking at his cigarette, is a creature that lives under the snow and slithers beneath young boys while they're skiing. Luca looked up, his eyes saucer wide. Lois Welch was there, the former chair of the English department here. She dropped her wine glass at the table. My goodness, Jim, why would you say such a thing to a young boy like this? The world is a cruel place, he said. The sooner he knows, the better. Jim learned the cruel world early, of course. He was seven or eight when a neighbor girl stabbed him in the eye with a shard of a broken bottle. We see that eye referenced on the second page of his first book in the poem, Sketch for a Job Application Blank. My left eye is blind and jogs like a milky sparrow in its socket. And the eye shows up who knows how many times within these 900 pages of the collected poems before its final appearance, by my accounting anyway, on page 829 in the poem, Melrose II. I'd like to have rain on this tin roof, an early memory that soothed my blind eye, hot and raw in my head at our little cabin on a lake. William Gass once wrote of Rilke, and I paraphrase, few lines in the early poems don't reappear, somehow reconstituted in the Duino elegies. The same could be said of Jim's work. Over half a century, his obsessions don't change. As Joseph Benarek points out in his editor's note to complete poems, the most frequently used words are bird, dog, time, love, river, God. But the registers through which Jim runs his existential and earthen concerns certainly do. The sacred and the profane remain wedded. I don't do divorces, he writes in After EQ. And he keeps to an insistence that poets should attempt to resolve the human condition within the colors of their metaphor, not with postmodern card tricks. Like Rilke's, Jim's poetic evolved through varied forms and modes, a relentless formal experimentation. A cage went in search of a bird. He was fond of quoting Kafka steered his poetic vocation. To step back from his body of work is to see half a century of American poetry in full regalia. Plain song and location stem from the Black Mountain tradition. The guzzles are a formal sequence, sequence influenced of course by the ancient Arabic. Letters to Yassinin, which Colin will talk about tonight, is a stunning collection of confessional epistles. And the new poems in Selected and New lean toward what I call the ambling meditative lyric, the long single stanza or stickic as it's called, which would become Jim's preferred nonce, poem, nonce form. But the long poem, the book length sequence was Jim's calling card, his finest grape, if you will. 
Despite the increasing popularity of such forms in American poetry, I've rarely heard Jim's name mentioned in the conversation, though he was certainly a masterful pioneer. His stamina as a novelist must have helped him here. He took inspiration from Keats, who said that the long poem was the test of invention, the polar star of the genre. Prodded by Bach recordings, Jim began working early in his career on the sweet form and extended that range and dexterity with the guzzles, Yasinin, theory and practice in rivers, of rivers, as well as the book length sequences after EQ, which Chris, Chris mentioned, and Geo Bestiary. Not that he was ever lacking in the irreverence department, but channeling EQ gave him access to what I think of as a fresh late career voice, a sanctified irreverence, if you will. And he entered a prolific mode that would carry him through several more wonderful books. I'm speaking here of Saving Daylight, In Search of Small Gods, Songs of Unreason, and Dead Man's Float. To some extent, these books are Jim's dotage, at least prosodically. The pressured lines and breaks of the early poems highly influenced by Robert Duncan and Denise Levertov, the rigor of the couplet, the coincised compressions of actor after EQ, these have largely given way to a discursive voice. Whatever you have to say, wrote Charles Olson, one of Jim's early models, leave the roots on, let them dangle and the dirt just to make clear where they come from. While looser formally, Jim's late career concerns, however, are far from light. By accident, my heart lifted with a rush, he writes in The Golden Window, a marvelous long poem about deliverance from depression. I'll read the first section and change now. By accident, my heart lifted with a rush, gone for weeks, finally home on a darkish day of blustery wind, napped, waking in a few minutes, and the sun had come clean and crept around the house. This light from one of trillions of stars falling through the window schemed by the willow's greenish bright yellow leaves so that my half asleep head opened wide for the first time in many months. A cold sunstroke, so yellow gold, so gold yellow, yellow gold. This eye beyond age bathed in light. 70 days on the river with a confusion between river turbulence and human tribulation. We are here to be curious, not consoled. This insistent curiosity by turns playful and rueful guides the late poems. Here's mom and dad from Saving Daylight in its entirety. Gentle readers, feel your naked belly button where you were tied to your mother. Kneel and thank her for your jubilant but woebegone life. Don't for a moment think of the mood of your parents when you were conceived, which so vitally affects your destiny. You have no control over that. And it's unprofitable to wonder if they were pissed off or drunk, bored, watching television news, listening to country music, or hopefully out in the orchard grass, feeling the crunch of windfall apples under their frantic bodies. And Cabbage from the same book begins, if only I had the genius of a cabbage or even an onion to grow myself in their laminae from the holy core that bespeaks the final shape. Nothing is outside us in this overinterpreted world. Jim revisits that philosophical assertion in River Six part of a sequence that anchors Songs of Unreason, his penultimate book. I thought years ago that old Heraclitus was wrong. You can't step into the same river even once. The water slips around your feet like liquid time and you can't dry it off after its passage. Don't bother taking your watch to the river. The moving water is a glorious second hand. Properly understood, the memory loses nothing, and we humans are never allowed to let our minds sit on a still bank and have a simple picnic. I had an unimaginable dream when young of being a river horse that could easily plunge upstream. Perhaps it came from our huge 
black mare June, whom I rode bareback as she swam the lake in big circles, always getting out where she got in. Meanwhile, this river is surrounded by mountains covered with lodgepole pines that are mortally diseased, browning in the summer sun. Everyone knows that lightning will strike and Montana burn. We all stay quiet about it, this blessed oxygen that makes the world a crematory. Only the water is safe. In my assessment, late in life, Jim seemed to approach each poetic engagement the way an experienced connoisseur might approach an old bottle of wine. I'm thinking specifically of a bottle we shared years ago. It was a 63 Colt de Bono, a dusty gift from our musician friend, Jeffrey Foucault, which raised pre-meal pre expectations to unreasonable levels. The painter Russell Chatham was in attendance for a leg of lamb that Linda Harrison had prepared and served alongside homegrown greens and apple cake. Chatham and Jim, who I would estimate spent more money in their life on wine than I've yet to make, um, were arguing about how long the wine would need to breathe before we drank it. Five minutes, one of them was saying, more than five, but fewer than 10, said the other. When the table was served, Russell opened the bottle of wine and held the cork to his beak-shaped nose. This, he said, should be brilliant. Or, Jim said gruffly, it could have turned. Thankfully for us with the late poems, it's nearly always the former. Again and again, we're treated to core samples of a mind that cast the widest net of a generation. No one moved up and down the chakras more effortlessly the novelist David James Duncan has said, than Jim. Brilliance or not, the poet was determined to be there each day when the bread came fresh from the oven, as Char said, or when the cork came free of the bottle, as it were. For Jim, poetry was survival, sustenance, and he left his readers nothing short of loaves multiplied. He kept up a torrid pace until his death. I was fortunate, though it often shamed my lack of output, to be on his poetry email list and the new work would arrive unfailingly each week. I once asked him how he managed to sustain, to sustain such a rate. The goose that lays the golden egg should not look at its ass, Jim answered, typical Jim. But then he added, I was freed into productivity by the utter lack of ambition. Some of his last poems, such as the eerily prophetic, Where is Jim Harrison? All poetic trappings seem to dissolve, and he returns to the plainest speech, or even the simple quatrain with an A, B, B, A rhyme scheme. This poem will remind you of the line Chris Latre just read, there are hundreds of ways to tip off a cushion. But the poem, Where is Jim Harrison, goes, he fell off a cliff, of a seven inch Zafu. He couldn't get up because of his surgery. He believes in a resurrection mostly because he was never taught not to. There's that young boy again. I was born a baby. What are these hundreds of suits of clothes I've worn? I had an unimaginable dream when young, right? To give up again this human shape as Terry quoted in the intro. We know that Jim died the day before Easter in 2016, died in the saddle, as it were, as he'd once written he hoped to, way back in the guzzles, which is to say, writing a poem, like another timeless American poet who defied convention, vastly enlarged our cosmology and contained multitudes. We look for Jim under our boot soles, or in each or stroke as the case is for me. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk more about, well, first of all, I would like to say that I've always wanted to be Terry Tempest Williams. For 30 years, at least, I wanted to be Terry. And I, she wishes she could be here today. And um, I'll do my best. Um, in her, Introduction to the edition of the complete poems. Um, Terry touches on 
what we would call politely my father's duality. Um, he could be achingly, infinitely sensitive at one moment, a kind of all-seeing empathetic eye, and then maddeningly, wildly coarse. And um, you should read Terry's essay and there's no point in getting into it here, but she does, she handles this brilliantly and she talks about all of it. Um, in daily life, when I was a teenager, he would go from reciting lines from Lorca or Hampson's Victoria. Um, he'd recite them on and on and drum into me that it was worth never holding back on love. And then he would go answer the door and tell one of my rare admirers that he'd blow his head off with a shotgun if he came near me. So it was it was interesting living with him. He'd eat some pasta, take a nap, write a poem. He worked harder than anybody all the time. Um, his family is thrilled with this collection from Copper Canyon. And I really want to thank everyone, everybody at the Montana Book Festival. And they're thrilled with the wonderful introductions to the different editions by Terry and Colm, uh, Joy Williams, Don Freeman. We've always wanted him to have more recognition for his poetry and want more people to see the world through his eyes. Um, and those eyes, like Chris was saying, you know, the good one that could look, that took in all the bright beauty and humor and cruelty of the world, what um, Joy Williams calls the eye that saw the world as it was, a holy terror dancing in the light. Well, the blind one, the poor one, the bad one that rolled in its milky socket like a moon was accomplice to his visions of commanding dreams as well as the dreams he dreamed awake. It's a good eye to have as a poet. Nevertheless, I would like to add here that there are at least 10 stories of the blinding and um, most of them are bullshit, okay? Um, Anyway, he was at home in both worlds. We all know that. He could be at home in both worlds. He could go from uh, a moment at the bar where he was just exquisitely sensitive with someone to just shrieking something out. And, you know, it's interesting growing up with that. Um, he was at home in both worlds. Joy Williams writes that she thinks of him as a religious poet. And this is one thing that Terry writes about in her essay. And it is true. Um, poetry was his soul's refreshment, a true bearing, a way of looking at the world and into your heart at the same time. The poems were a necessity. In an email today, Terry talks about, talked about um, a fugue between nature and religion and the world, especially in the way um, Dead would spill out great sheaves of poetry by heart. The one he would fall on most often, um, the one I can still hear his voice reciting, was the Gasela of the Dark Death by Lorca. Um, I want to sleep the dream of apples, to withdraw from the tumult of cemeteries. I want to sleep the dream of that child who wanted to cut his heart on the high seas. He was simply an extreme romantic and so much of what he wrote was built by losses, his father and his sister, Judy, and in the case of theory and practice of rivers, my young cousin, Gloria. Um, but to get back to the duality, um, before I read a bunch of grim poems and I, I'm enjoying, I'm gonna leave the humor out of my um, selections, unfortunately, but we can get into that later. And I'm sure Colm, Chris did it, Chris did it, it's wonderful. To get back to the duality, which Terry deals with in her essay, he also once quoted at least 20 lines of the book of Revelation when I came downstairs one morning while visiting from college, stupidly wearing red after being out a bit late. Behold the scarlet whore of Babylon. He could quote the Bible, he could quote whatever, but I just remember sitting there trying to choke down some coffee and plot my escape. Um, he was relentless. Um, he was very stubborn. Uh, and you know we loved him a lot. I'd like to start with his very early poem, sketch from a job application bank, which Chris cited, but let's just do it because it's a biography. It's, it was still good 40 years later. My left eye is blind and jogs like a milky sparrow in its socket. My nose is large and never flares in anger. The front teeth bucked, but not in lechery. I sucked my thumb until the age of 12. Oh, my youth was happy and I was never lonely, though my friends called me pig-eye and the teachers thought me loony. 
When I bruised, my psyche kept intact. I fell from horses and once a cow, but never pigs, a neighbor lost a hand to a sow. But I had some fears, the salesman of eyes, his case full of fishy baubles against black velvet, jeweled gore, the great cocked hoof of a Belgian mare, a nest of milk snakes by the water trough, electric fences, my uncle's hounds, the pump arm of an oil well, the chop and whir of a combine in the sun. From my ancestors, the Swedes, I suppose I inherit the love of rainy woods, kegs of herring and neat whiskey. I remember long nights of pinnacle, the bulge of redmond in my grandpa's cheek, the rug smelled of manure and kerosene. They laughed loudly and didn't speak for days. But on the other side, from the German Mennonites, their rag smoke prayers and porky daughters, I got intolerance and aimless diligence. In 51, during a revival, I was saved. I prayed on a cold register for hours and woke up lame. I was baptized by immersion in the tank at Williamstown. The rusty water stung my eyes. I left off the old things of the flesh, but not for long. One night beside a pond, she dried my feet with her yellow hair. Oh, actual event, dead quotient, cross become green. I still love Jubal, but pity Hagar. Now self is the first sacrament, who loves not the misery and taint, but the present tense is lost. I strain for a lunar arrogance. Light macerates, the lamp infects warmth. More warmth, I cry. Um, I'd also like to read The Theory and Practice of Rivers, just the first two pages. And I might get a little wobbly at the end of it, but, um, and then just two more short poems. The rivers of my life, moving looms of light, anchored beneath the log at night, I can see the moon up through the water as shattered milk, the nudge of fishes, belly and back, in turn grating against log and bottom and letting go, the current lifts me up and out into the dark, gathering motion, drifting into an eddy with a sideways swirl, the sandbar cooler than the air. To speak it clearly, how the water goes is how the earth is shaped. It is not much that I got here, there from here. It is, excuse me. It is not so much that I got there from here, which is everyone's story, but the shape of the voyage, how it pushed outward in every direction until it stopped. Roots and plants and trees, certain coral heads, photos of splintered lightning, blood vessels, the shapes of creeks and rivers. This is the ascent out of water. There is no time but that of convenience. Time so that everything won't happen at once. Dark doesn't fall. Dark comes up out of the earth and exhalation. It gathers itself close to the ground, rising to envelop us as if the bottom of the sea rose up to meet us. Have you ever gone to the bottom of the sea? Mute unity of water. I sculpted this girl out of ice so beautifully she was taken away. How banal the swan song, which is a water song. There never was a swan who said goodbye. My raven in the pine tree squawked his way to death, falling from branch to branch to branch again to ground. The song muffle of earth as the body falls, feather against pine needles. Near the estuary north of Guilford, my brother recites the Episcopalian burial service over his dead daughter. Gloria as in Gloria in excelsis. I cannot bear this passion and courage. My eyes turn toward the swamp and sea, so blurred I'll never quite clear themselves again. The inside of the eye, vitreous humor, is the same pulp found inside the squid. I can see Gloria in the snow and in the water. She lives in the snow and water and in my eyes. This is a song for her. Two more short ones. Um, I'm gonna do Lullaby for a Daughter, which was written, I think, when we lived in uh, Kingsley, Michigan. Go to sleep. Night is a coal pit full of black water. Night's a dark cloud full of warm rain. Go to sleep. Night is a flower resting from bees. Night's a green sea swollen with fish. Go to sleep. Night is a white moon riding her mare. Night, a bright sun burned to a black cinder. Go to sleep. Night's come. Cat's day, owl's day, star's feast of praise, moon to reign over her sweet subject, dark. And one last one from Dead Man Floating, which is filled with so many great poems and I'm glad 
Miss Leteria was mentioning them. I'm going to do Tiny Bird um, because when uh, Chris Dombrowski said that, I mean, I, it's true, died in the saddle, he died writing, but I thought of him as dying like a bird from a branch, simply falling. And, and it was such a relief that this is how it happened. Tiny Bird, the urge to be a tiny bird upon a tiny limb, maybe a bridled titmouse standing on its spidery feet. Not a big guy who falls with a resounding thump and bruises sideways and pastures, sidewalks and pastures, sinks in river mud to the waist. If my feet were spears, I would have descended to one of the tumultuous underground rivers which are everywhere, earth worn by the black current. When young, I thought I'd die in my thirties, like so many of my favorite poets. At 75, I see this hasn't happened. Still, I am faithful to my poems and birds. Birds are poems I haven't caught yet. Thanks for having me. Jamie, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I am, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm moved to silence um, in, in, in um, the way that I look at um, the people who are on board here from Ireland, from Montana, from North Carolina, from New York, everyone listening to you and, 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 and reading the poems uh, from your father. Uh, I did think it's just extraordinary. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to like... Um, uh, read one paragraph from uh, Terry Tempest Williams and what she had to say uh, about Jim in her beautiful introduction. On March 26, 2016, I learned of Jim's death. I grieved his passing and celebrated his life. He was among the great ones, an elevated soul in all his unruliness, who favored his senses and courted the wild on the page and in the world. His was a storied life that loomed large and we are all the beneficiaries. And the thing about tonight is that we are all the beneficiaries. I mean, can I just say thank you to the Montana Book Festival. Thank you to Copper Canyon Press who have had the bravery uh, to go in and take this poetry and, 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 and re package it and, and, and present it to us in this most extraordinary way because first and foremost um, Jim uh, was, is uh, a poet and I will tell you that I carried his poems when I was a young man I carried his poems cross country uh, on, a, on, a, on a bicycle and uh, then I got to meet him many many years later and uh, one of the things that I did uh, when I met him as we all do, or all did, eventually, uh, in a bar. Um, and he um, listened to me read from my favorite poem, um, Letters to Yesenin, or Yesenin. And I'm going to read a couple of sections from, 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 from that tonight, and then open it up to the, the debate from all around the world. But i got to tell you, looking at the chat box just to see where everyone's from, uh, to see people in there, uh, friends, heroes, um, Rick Bass is in there, all sorts of people are, 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 are in there. It just makes my heart uh, sort of expand with joy. So thank you to everyone. I'm going to read four sections of letters to Yusenin. Number one. This matted and glossy photo of Yesenin bought at a Leningrad newsstand permanently tilted on my desk, he doesn't stare at me. He stares at nothing. The difference between a plane crash and a noose adds up to nothing. And what can I do with heroes with my brain fixed on so few of them? Again, nothing. Regard his flat magazine eyes with my half-cocked own. Both of us seeing nothing, 
in the vodka was nothing and Isadora was nothing and that plank bridge near your village home in Riazan covered seven feet of nothing. The clumsy noose that swung the tilted body was nothing but a noose, the law of gravity, this seeking for the ground, a few feet of nothing between shoes and the floor, a light year away. So, this is a song for Yesenin and his noose that came to nothing. But did a good job, as we say back home, where there's nothing but snow. But I stood under your balcony in St. Petersburg, yes, St. Petersburg, a crazed tourist with so much nothing in my heart, it wanted to implode. And I walked down to Neva Embankment with a fine sleet falling, and there was finally something, a great river vastly flowing, flat as your eyes, something to marry to my nothing heart, other than the poems you hurled into nothing those years before the articulate noose. So this is a poem about the great Russian lyric poet, uh, Sergei Yesenin, who died in 1925. Uh, he died in the Hotel Angleterre in St. Petersburg. Uh, and there was no ink in the room, so the legend goes, so, so he wrote in his own blood. Jim wrote this poem in his 30s, um, and it was supposed to begin as a suicide note and became something so much more glorious than that. And I hope to capture that in um, the way that he captured us in his poetry. So, number two. I don't have any medals. I feel their lack of weight on my chest. Years ago, I was ambitious, but now it is clear that nothing will happen. All those poems that made me soar along a foot from the ground are not so much forgotten as never read in the first place. They rolled like moons of light into a puddle, and they were drowned. Not even the puddle can be located now. Yet I am encouraged by the way you hang yourself, telling me that such things don't matter. You, the fabulous poet of Mother Russia, but still, even now, schoolgirls hold your dead heart your poems in their laps on a hot August afternoon by the river while they wait for their boyfriends to get out of work or their lovers to return from their army, their dead pets to return to life again to be called to supper. You have a new life on their laps and can scent their lavender scent, the cloud of hair that falls over you feel their feet trailing in the river or hidden in a purse walk the neva again best of all you are used like a badly badly like a bouquet of flowers to make them shed their dresses in apartments see those steam pipes running along the ceiling the rope These last few notes to you have been a bit more somber, like biographies of artists written by joyless people, so that the whole book is a record of agony at 30 rather than 33 and a turd. You know the sound. Keats was very unhappy about dying. Twenty six. Going into the bar last Sunday night, I noticed they were having high school graduation down the street. Caps and gowns, June and mayflies fresh from the channel, fluttering in the warm still air. After a few drinks, I felt jealous and I wanted someone to say, 
Best of luck to you in your chosen field, or the road of life is ahead of you. Remember your first trip to Moscow at 19? Everything was possible. You watched those noble women at the riding academy who would soon be permanently unhorsed, something you were to have mixed feelings about, what with the way poets suck up to or are attracted to the aristocracy, however Jim crack. And though the great block welcomed you, you felt tentative, an unknown quantity, and remained so for several years. But how quickly one goes from being unknown and embarrassed to being bored and arrogant, from being ignored to expecting deference, from flea bag rooms to at least the plaza. And the daydreams and the hustling and the fantasies and the endless work you get from one to the other only to discover that you really want to go home. Start over with a new deck. But back home, all the animals are dead. The friends have disappeared and the fields have gone to weed. The fish have flown from the creeks and ponds and the birds have all drowned or gone to Chile. No one knows you. They have little time for poetry in the country, or in the city for that matter, except for the ministrations of a few friends. Your name bobs up like a Halloween apple. And literature people have the vague feeling that they should have read you if they ever catch up on their reading. Oh, once on a train. I saw a girl reading a book of mine, but she was homely, and I had a toothache, so I let the moment pass. What delicious notoriety. The journalist said I looked like a, a beer salesman or a bricklayer, not being fashionably slender, but lately the sun shines through. The sweet release of flinging these lines at the dead. Almost like my baby Anna, throwing grain to the horses a mile away in the far corner of the pasture. Postscript. At 8, 12 a.m., all of the watches in the world are being wound, which is not quite the same thing as all of the guitars on earth being tuned at midnight, or that all of the suicides come after the mailman when all hope is gone. Before the mailman, watches are wound and windows look through and shoes precisely tied, tooth care, the attenuations of the hangover noted which is not the same as the new moon after midnight or her bare feet stepping slowly toward you and the snake easing himself from the ground for a meal. The world is so necessary. Someone must execute stray dogs and free the space they're taking up. I can see people I can see people walking down Nevsky Prospect, winding their watches before you were discovered too far above the ground. That mystical space that was somewhere occupied by a stray dog or a girl in an asylum on her hands and knees, a hanged face turned slowly from a plum to a lump of coal. I'm winding my watch in antipathy. I see the cat racing round the yard in a fantasy of threat. She's preparing for eventualities. She prizes the only prize, but we aren't the cats we once were thousands of years ago. You didn't die with the dignity of an animal. Today, you make me want to tie myself to a tree. Stake my feet to earth herself so I can't get away. It didn't come to me as a burning bush or a pillar of light.
But I have decided to stay. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. So beautiful. Colm, Chris, Jamie, my goodness. Um, you know, <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. To I mean, he decided to stay, right? I mean, he, 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 he decided to stay. You know, that was not a real fun time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but he decided to stay. When you when, when when you when you hear that poem or when you read that poem when you think about that poem and you know that he decided to stay, what does it make you think? Well, mostly it makes me remember going up and reading the pages when he was writing them when I was thirteen or fourteen. It makes me think of fear. Um, you know, it makes me think. You know, you know things are iffy. It just he. Uh, you know, he worked. He just worked. He was not going to leave. Right. And, and that is not to say anything bad about somebody who decides to leave. I just found this, by the way. Oh, my gosh. That's so beautiful. <laughs> I, I, I just saw this, by the way. <laughs> the, shiny, the shiny is seen in the Degut in, I think, 1971 or 72 in Russia. Incredible. Incredible. Um and 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 but 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 you know um, all those poems the uh, Chris and Chris, you know uh, um, we all linked in 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 this incredible way. Yeah, they were all very different too. I mean, they were completely dissimilar gems, right. which you could manage. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was beautiful, Colin. That was that was really. I have trouble. I do have trouble reading Yasinan. And that made it kind of wonderful again. Um, I mean, that poem, um, you, uh, I, I mean, you can read it aloud. I mean, it's 30 pages, you know, 30 days and you can feel it. And, 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 and yet it's a lifetime. And, you know, people are on, online talking about like, um, you know, you know, who is Jim and, you know, what, what, what is it? And, you know, I knew and loved Jim, as you know, and got to meet him many times. And I think he's a poet, he's a poet, he's a poet, he's a yeah. poet, he's a poet. And the fact that Copper Canyon are doing this now and, 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 and working to not resurrect the career, but, but just keep it going, is the most beautiful and brave and one of the great decisions of publishing uh, right now. And, and I, I salute them for what they're doing. I, I do, too. It's wonderful. When you were drive, when you were riding your bike across America, were you, was that Yusinan you were reading? Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. And so <laughs> what else were you reading? <laughs> no. <laughs> I was reading all sorts of things, but 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 when I met him in New York, I was able to quote it, and 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 we yeah. were a bit um, overserved. Yeah. <laughs> And he was amazed uh, by it, and 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 um, but yeah, it, yeah, it was, it, it 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 was the collected poems, in fact. But that was the poem that got me and tore my heart wide open. You were fourteen when he wrote it. I think he wrote it twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Anna was very small, and you know, the thing about her bathrobe sort of hanging on the, the bathrobe the hanging, screaming, you know, yeah. don't do it. Oh, yeah. He was not. I mean, there was, he did not make money until um, I was 17 and Anna was six, I would say. I mean, he really didn't make more than 12 grand a year until that year. And then everything kind of went bad. Can I ask you, can I ask you like a weirdly obvious question, but, but, but I hope you take it the right way. How much do you, <laughs> what? How much do you, how much do you miss him? Um, Quite a bit. I, I think of him constantly. He was having such a hard time by the end that I can't say that I wanted him to continue. He was having a horrible, horrible right. time. He was in pain. He had been in pain for five years. 
Um, our mother had died uh, six months before he did, and he simply did not have it in him. So yeah. to that degree, when I think of him, I don't long for him. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I, I just, it, it was so, um, the way he died was such a fucking, I hate the words like blessing, you know me, I am completely irreligious, I am whatever, but it was a blessing and he was smiling when I saw him. And, yeah. um, and so when I miss him, I want to send him something. I want to tell him to read something. I want to engage with his mind. The mm-hmm. physical reality of it was sort of hard right. to, you know what I mean? Kind of. So it's but a different he wrote about He wrote about dying in the act of love. I mean, don't, don't you remember he had some, I mean, Chris and Chris like jump in here, uh, but um, he wrote about dying in the act of love, and he died in the act of love, which was the act of poetry. Yeah. yeah. You know, one, one of the things that I liked about it, too, is that, you know, Jamie, hearing you talk about how much he was suffering, but at the same time, you know, I'm not exactly a spring chicken anymore. And and one of the things that I love about his work is is almost this roadmap for growing old with some dignity yes. and, and maintaining the passion and 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 still living the life of a poet, you know, because being a poet is more than just words on the page, you know, it's, it's the way you look at the world and the way that you process that world through not just your mind, but everything. Yes. And, and, and how that expresses whether it's on the page or, or in the way you live your life. And that is one of the things that I came to enjoy or, or connect to so much was was just growing old and and still doing the work, you know, and, and still doing it well and not just kind of coasting into oblivion, you know? Yeah. That's one of the things that I take from it for sure. Sure. And he, you know, that whole winter, he kept writing. He kept writing poems. He sat out with the hummingbirds. He ate everything. You know, we put on the dog. We had rabbit, we had duck. We had anything that would sort of coax him into happiness and he had happiness he um we had a night with some friends uh about three nights before he died and before i flew home um from arizona i'd been down there and we left um this beautiful place in the san rafael and as we drove away there were all these sort of glowing spots and we realized they were wild rabbits they were hares everywhere mm-hmm. leaping around they looked like fireflies like you would have seen in Michigan. And he started sort of scribbling something down like that. And that is not one of the last poems, but yeah, he was, he was just always on and he was, um, yes, he's a good model. Just keep going because he really did a lot in the last few years, despite pain and he loved life. And he obviously, um, loved it every which way (laughs) so you know I was going to say that the um, favorite words I think Chris Dombrowski mentioned uh, words that he kept repeating you left out bottom right (laughs) come on (laughs) talking about the bottom of the river (laughs) bottom of the glass (laughs) right (laughs) yeah um, Ben Merrick does Joseph does mention in his um, uh in his editor's note that um, at least in Off to the Side, you know, Jim's memoir, um, Stripping did make the list of the obsessions. So uh, to be fair, Joseph Joseph covered that. Um, I just, I wanna say again, just what a magical night this is and how, how wonderful it is to be here. Um, feeling, feeling Jim through his poems um, and to see such a robust response from, from really all over the world. It's, it's flipping fabulous. Um, we're getting we're getting a few questions in the in the chat room, and um, I just wanted to. There are a number of attendees that have asked a similar question, so um, I want to throw this out there for for everyone and uh, see if we can't uh, come to some kind of consensus or um, or, or even a great argument about it. Um, one question for our panelists. Do you see Jim entering the poetic canon in the future? I mean, I especially mean his poems appearing in the anthologies of American literature and being spoken of as a poet. 
He was a poet first and foremost, a poet who happened to also write good novels and nonfiction. Why is his poetry not more widely known? Will it just take time uh, so that he can't be ignored like Whitman can't be, uh, even though there have always been those who like uh, these, uh, I can't quite figure out the rest, but uh, we've got the gist of it, right? Um, does anyone want to take a stab at that question? I mean, I will say he can't be ignored. He won't be ignored. Um, uh, some of it might uh, take time, but I think amongst those of us who know what what's going on in literature, um, that the publication of these books uh, is an incredibly important moment. And this sort of stuff uh, will last and the debate will last beyond all these uh, other debates that might go might go around poetry or culture or whatever else it happens to be, uh, this stuff, as far as I'm concerned, will last, and and Jim Harrison will be considered one of the great American poets. Yes. Let's go. Well, he's in my canon, and I have a big mouth, so I'm going to do my part. <laughs> Years ago, um, I went to the University of Michigan. I only got an undergraduate degree. I didn't get an MFA. Um, but I uh, had a teacher named Barros, and he had put Jim in the Norton Anthology in the 60s. And that was sort of, I know that he probably would have loved more of that. I know he would have, and he wouldn't admit it. Um, yeah, I would love to see more of that. But on the other hand, um, as Joy Williams points out in her essay, fuck him, you know, as <laughs> Dad would say, so. Yeah, where's their, uh, what's the great line? Where's their grapes of wrath? They don't even have a grapes of goofy from the Fergus interview. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. The Paris review. Um, yeah. Joy, Joy made the point that uh, he should have been put into, it, it. I won't get into it. It was, um, yeah, Harold Bloom's yeah. anthology. Harold yeah. Bloom's yeah. anthology, yeah. yeah. But whatever. Yeah. It, it, it will all eventually come out, just like, you know, the you know, time will take care of it. History will take care of it. And and and, and all the little like like noisy things around the edges will be noisy for a little while, but but time will take care of it. Um I really do think that 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 the solidity um, of this voice is um, and 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 I'm a novelist um, and I love the novels and uh, but it was the poetry that I always always went to and will always go to. Same here. Same here. Jamie, um, not to keep you in the spotlight here, but. Um, <laughs> One attendee asks, Jamie, were you reluctant to become a writer with a father as a writer? Yes. It didn't seem like a good way to make a living. How's that? Um, yes, I was wildly, but, you know, talk about, uh, that's why I wrote mysteries to begin with, frankly, to sort of distance it. And oddly as a way of making a living because I'd lost my job. Um, I was working for Clark City Press for Russell's press out here. And uh, we did about 20 books and we went out of business and I'd moved out here and I had a young child and I needed to make a living. So I tried writing a mystery and I wrote four. And that was that. Yeah. Chris, I'd like to hear from you. Chris Latre. Yeah. <laughs> Chris. <laughs> what what's the question? Do you want me to ask you a fucking question? Are you serious? Or you just want me to talk? Because I'll yeah, how much time we got. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I you know, I you can't be in Montana and and really do any kind of writing without stumbling over Jim Harrison all the time, you know? So, you know, I, I, I came to him, like I said, through his, his fiction and his nonfiction and poetry, you know, I, I saw that someone in the early questions asked, you know, why do we think he identified as a poet above anything else? And 
I mean, if, if you can, you do, you know what I mean? Because if, if, if people start calling you a poet, you hang on to that. And, and I think, you know, that recognition early on and, and the events, you know, and, and maybe these Jamie are a little mythical too about, you know, losing his family members and, and realizing at that moment, you know, that I've read interviews where he said, you know, if, if life can end so quickly, then what, then why not go all in basically is what he's saying, you know, just damn the torpedoes. This is what I'm going to do with my life. And he chose poetry, you know, and we're, and we're better for it. And I, you know, from my, again, following that path that I feel he blazed for, for me and other people, um, you know, I didn't consider myself a poet until people started calling me one. And then I kind of thought back and I thought of all the reasons that, that I was drawn to Jim because he wrote whatever the fuck he wanted to write. You know, he wasn't going to get pigeonholed as, as a novelist or a, or a, you know, a, a food writer or whatever. A, a friend of mine said, I don't get this food writing. It's not even food writing. It's like, that's the point. <laughs> you know, that's the freaking point. And, and if you can lead with, with identifying as a poet, man, I just, I just think it's great. And I, I love that. That's amazing. Can, can, can I ask Chris Dombrowski, Chris, like seriously, do you think that you actually really wanted to have a propane tank? Because the fact of the matter is you've got a fucking great story out of it by not having a propane tank. Absolutely. It, it probably, um, you know, endeared me to Jim a little more anyway. I think he could see. I, I, I remember... Um, the first time I met him, you know, I grew up, um, well, I'll tell this story. Um, I, uh, Jim was incredibly generous um, to young poets. Um, and he was uh, in Missoula to give um, a reading uh, for the political campaign of Denise Juno, uh, who was a, a Blackfeet political upstart uh, who would later go on to become basically our um, uh, Secretary of Education in Montana, and Jim had had uh, waived his normally robust uh, reading fee to come and read in honor of um, of Denise and to raise money for her campaign. And and he talked a lot about James Welch when he was there. Um, afterwards, there were you know a dozen or so young poets fawning over him and uh he decided to take us to a um take us all to a restaurant which uh was famous for its generous portions of um uh, belly if i remember correctly um and my friend uh mandy smoker uh an incredible poet from far eastern montana uh and a cinnaboyne woman who's now the director of indian ed for all uh you know the poem to a meadow lark in saving daylight that's dedicated to mandy um, anyway, I talked about Jim for years because I'd grown up in Michigan and, and um, she brought me over to Jim at the table and said, um, I want you to meet my friend Chris. Uh, he's a poet and a fishing guide I was telling you about. And Jim, you know, did that bear grunt he did. And um, Mandy added that I was originally from Michigan, to which Jim said, who the fuck isn't? Millions of people are from Michigan. <laughs> But I told him I was from East Lansing uh, and uh, he said, I went to school there, you know, and I, I said, of course, I'm aware of that. And uh, he said, exactly where in East Lansing did you grow up? And I said, I, I grew up on Gainesboro Road, half a block from Harrison Road. And he said, he kind of did a double take and he said, sit down, son, I'll buy you a drink. Why didn't you say so? You know, um, so as Jamie mentioned, you know, he had that ability to be um incredibly gruff and, and coarse and crass and then just um just deliver the the most most tenderness as well um you know i wanted to address real briefly as the q a questions pile up uh the question of of will he be remembered as a poet i think the the i agree with column you know undoubtedly he will be remembered as one of the the great poets of his generation. Um, one of his problems is that he probably did too many things too well, right? Even as a poet, he was um, incredibly uh, 
flexible. He, you know, if you just took his food poems, for instance, you might say Jim Harrison was one of the great food poets of his generation, right? Or um, if you just took his long poems, you would say, I would say anyway, no one wrote better long poems or more fine long poems or book sequences than anyone in a whole generation. So um, I, I have faith that um, over time, this, this work will last and, and be, um, be read as one of the durable voices of a um, of hundred years. Sorry, Jamie. No, I just want to say he wrote, a po he wrote poetry every day. That's what he thought of himself as completely and absolutely. Um, everything else was sort of taking away from it. And you're kind of, I think, um, to what Chris Latre was saying, you're, you're essentially kind of born a poet, I think. So when I talked about becoming a writer, I became a writer, but dad was born a poet. And, and that is just, it just is the way he thought all the time through his head, through his head, listen to me. But I mean, all the time he was thinking of sentences even if it was just sentences when he was bricklaying, you know, when he was working, when he was doing, when he was teaching and not reading all those poor students' papers, he really um, <laughs> was thinking of poems, so. Well, can I just say that the, 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 the poetry continues, the music continues, um, it, it's kind of amazing, um, Jamie. It's kind of brilliant to 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 to, to hear you speak. Um, your dad is here with us, um, in the most extraordinary way. Um, I think what 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 Copper Canyon have done, and thank you to everybody at the uh, at the Montana Festival uh, for doing this. Is um, you know, you know, you know. Uh, giving us a chance to keep all of this stuff um, going and um, I just want to say uh, to hear you read his poems was one of the great privileges of my life tonight so um, thank you so much and <laughs> no that was wonderful that your reading have you seen in Oh, but, but all those incredible people who were on here tonight I was I was looking at the chat box it was uh, fantastic Um Hi, Rick. But, um, oh, oh, by the way, hi, Rick. Yes. If he's still on there. Um, hi, hi, hi there. And then hi from Terry Tempest Williams, who was really sorry that, 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 that she couldn't make it. And I'm going to sign off here soon. Uh, but I, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to everyone for being so amazing. Thank you. Is that, is that my cue, Colin? No, it's not your cue. <laughs> No, it is. <laughs> it is. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, such an enormous thank you to Chris Dombrowski, Chris Latre, Jamie Harrison, Colin McCann, and Terry Tempest Williams. You know, you were not, you were not uh, absent here, obviously. What a beautiful and funny and emotional tribute this evening has been. Thank you, audience, for being here and asking great questions and engaging each other and these, these authors in the chat tonight. Um, thank you to our event sponsors, Arts Missoula, MissoulaEvents.net, uh, our Collector's Edition sponsor, The Whitefish Review. Thank you so much. Of course, Humanities Montana, the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation. Um, and thank you to our event partner, the publisher, Copper Canyon Press. Thank you so much for your work uh, in keeping Jim's poetic legacy alive. And thank you for complete poems. Um, audience members, please know that you can access this video again and again and again on the Montana Book Festival's YouTube channel. It is there uh, for ever, uh, I suppose, um, because there are some wonderful readings tonight and, and we should be able to watch them again and again. Um, and just as a reminder to you as well, you can purchase Jim Harrison Complete Poems at Fact and Fiction Books, both in store here in Missoula, Montana, and online at factandfictionbooks.com. Uh, please be sure to enter MBF at checkout so that 20% of those sales do come back to the festival. Um, I can't, I can't thank you for enough. Thank you so much for being here. And oh, I, sh I should shout out again, Joseph Bednarik. Uh, we couldn't have been here without you either. So thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so yeah. much. Oh, my most humble pleasure. Thank you. Everyone have a wonderful night.